Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples in a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his coat, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God be with us this day. May the meditations of all of our hearts be with you now and always. Amen. In today's scripture, we learn that Jesus healed a blind beggar. A man who could not see had an encounter with Jesus. Here's what happened. Jesus and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. It was common in Jesus' time for a rabbi to teach as he traveled from place to place. So it was customary for Jesus to journey in a large crowd. He would be teaching as he traveled along the road. During this journey, there was a blind man, Bartimaeus, and he was sitting by the roadside. It was also common in Jesus' time to encounter people begging along the road. If someone was so infirm that they could not do physical work necessary to earn a living, then one of their resources was to beg. Also in Jesus' time, being blind wasn't just a disability, it was considered a curse. Being blind meant that people, that the person who was blind was being punished by God for something terrible they had done or something terrible their parents had done. This person was not thought of well by society, and they were discarded by the community. Begging by the side of the road was how they survived, and sadly, it was how they interacted with their peers. The man no doubt heard the commotion of a group traveling down the road. When he discovered that it was in fact the Messiah coming towards him, he did whatever was necessary to be noticed by Jesus. He yelled and yelled and yelled and yelled louder until he caught the attention of everyone in the crowd. And when Jesus asked to see the man, he sprang to his feet and came as quickly as he could. Jesus wasted no time in asking, what do you want me to do for you? And as quickly as the question was asked, came the response, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus healed him and told him that his faith had made him well. Now, if, if I had been miraculous, miraculously sorry, given my sight, I think my reaction would have been different. I think I would have run through the town showing everyone that I could see. I think I would show the community that I was no longer an outcast. I would go to my friends and my family and let them see the new me. I might even go to a doctor, or in this case, during this time period, a priest, and let the experts have a look at me. But this man's reaction to receiving his sight was to remain with Jesus and follow him on the way. This man was different. There were a couple of other things that Bartimaeus did that were different, that are worth us noting this morning. First, he knew what he wanted, and nothing was going to stop him from having that moment with Jesus. Not in getting his attention and not in asking for his sight. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the man said, I want to see. Usually when we want something from someone, 
Don't we usually give a background? Don't we usually tell the person the reasons of what we want and why? This was a man who lived on the streets and survived as a beggar. So if we put that in modern day context, I have been approached many times, and I'll admit differently from the regular person in the role of a pastor, uh, coming to the church in Florida, this is common. I have been approached many times to, uh, to be asked for money, to be asked for someone who is down on their luck to help them out. And usually before I get asked if I can help with the rent or if I can put gas in the car, or whatever it is, usually I get an account from the person of why they are in the position they are in, why they are a victim of circumstance, how they have a plan to turn their life around and, and that plan goes right into action as soon as I give them what they need and how they will come back and pay me back for what I have given them. Now, I'm not meaning to convey that this exchange is negative or erroneous or a bad thing. I am saying that I think it is, at least in my experience as a pastor, it is human nature to try and explain our actions to people when we want help from them. But this man was different. No beating around the bush when asked a question. No explanation of how hard life had been. No bargaining for a quid pro pro. No promise of how he will worship God from this day forward. The man knew exactly what he wanted from Jesus because he knew exactly who he was as a person. And he knew who it was that he was addressing. And that's the other thing to note here. Bartim is called Jesus, son of David. The Jewish nation believed that the Messiah would come from David's line. Bartimaeus believed he was dealing with God's chosen Messiah. So his reaction to Jesus was personal, it was honest, and it came from a place of love. When he asked Jesus to cure his blindness, he was asking for so much more than Jesus to cure his physical blindness. Lamar Williamson says the healing of blind Bartimaeus is not simply a vivid story with a moral for Christians. It is a witness to Jesus Christ and it is a call to follow him, but also to all who, knowing their blindness, want to see and to all who, seeing, follow Jesus on the way. Bartimaeus was a blind beggar. He was a man that was discarded by society. A man who probably spent his life being ignored and passed by by most of the world. But this was also a man who knew who he was, knew that Jesus was God's son. This was a man that knew Christ could heal him. This was a man that knew his faith could make him well. This was a man who knew his calling was to follow Jesus. This man was different. This is a story of a forgotten man who had a heart for Jesus. This is also a story about the passion and the insight of our Lord. You ever been watching a television show, a police show or a lawyer show, and, and they're, they're, they're with the, the suspect or, or the witness, and they ask in the shows, they always ask questions that they know the answer to. And parents do this all the time. We all do this every day. Our kid comes home from school, we have information that they may or may not know that we have, and we'll say, how was school today? And they'll say, fine. Really? Just fine? Anything special happen? Anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to tell me? We do this all the time when we know the answers to what we're asking. When Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you today? I believe he already knew that this man wanted to be set free, already knew that he wanted to follow, serve, and, put, and praise Jesus for all that he was doing. The fact that Jesus knows us so well is both a wonderful and a scary thing. And that's because it is an opportunity to discipleship. And that's what we learn from this story. Jesus comes and he asks each one of us, what do you want me to do for you? And we in that moment can be as honest and as eager as Bartimaeus. We can tell Jesus that we want to see. And once Jesus removes our blindness, once he takes away that barrier that is keeping us 
from truly serving God, then we are free and we can set our feet on the road to discipleship. William Barclay says this, Bartimaeus may have been a beggar by the wayside, but he was a man full of thanks. He was a person who had need, went on to gratitude and finished with loyalty. And that is the perfect summary of the stages of discipleship. So our relationship with Jesus Christ is a journey of discipleship and it involves need and it involves gratitude and it involves loyalty. So first there is need. What is it that we want Jesus to do for us today? What is it that is blocking us from living all that we can for God? What is that barrier? What is in the way? What is it that makes us blind? and unable to see our path. Is it guilt? Is it shame? Maybe it's apathy. Maybe it's, maybe it's a lack of understanding, lack of faith, lack of commitment. Maybe there's something that you did or something that you didn't do, and that's a conversation between you and God. Maybe it's lack of perseverance. Maybe it's a want to know Christ better. A want to be able to teach someone about God. A want for a new challenge that is coming your way. When we approach God with a need, and Christ fills that need, that sets us on that path to move forward. And when that need is taken care of, that then comes gratitude. And if you're like me, you probably have lots and lots of things to be grateful, thankful for. And, and, and I bet our list, a lot of our list, is the same. We're thankful for our health and, and, and our life and our families and our friends and, and the things we do in this world to make a difference. But if I, think, if, I think, if I think about it for a minute and if I take that gratitude to the next level, then I need to be able to say to God, I am grateful that you have given me life. I am grateful that you have called me to serve. I am grateful that I can be humble and as much as I know what I do in this world is for you and not for me. I am grateful that I with my life can tell one person and make one person, one pair, make a difference in one person's life. I am grateful for all that God has given me. And so when that need is satisfied, and then we move to gratitude. And then that third benchmark would be loyalty. It is glorious that Christ answers that need and always will. It is wonderful that we can have the gratitude in what God does for us. But it means nothing if we don't have loyalty to God. If we are not taking everything that God gives us and giving that to the world for God. We need to show loyalty. We need to be witnessing. We need to be helping. We need to be making a difference. We need to be doing mission work and furthering Christianity and telling people proudly who God is and what God's all about. And I'm not talking about the man that comes up to us on the street that asks if we know God, the stereotypical Bible-thumping person that everybody looks at in a strange way. And talking about living our lives in such a way that make people take notice. That makes us show that there is something different about us. That we have something different going on in our lives that others don't have. That's the loyalty that we show to God. That's the loyalty that we show in gratitude by putting God first in our lives. So... If you haven't guessed by now, I like to bring everything together with a story. So today's no different. This is a story about a man who was settling down on a Sunday morning. Well, I probably shouldn't have said Sunday morning. He probably should have been in church. Huh? Anyway, it's a man who was settling down. I say Sunday morning because he was settling down to read the Sunday paper. You know, the big paper. And, and he sits in the chair and he's got the paper in front of his face. And his little five-year-old boy, if you want a name, we'll call him Bobby. Little Bobby comes up. And he, he clanks up in his lap, pulls down the paper, and says, Daddy, will you play with me? And so the man wants to play with his son, but he just wants to read the Sunday paper. So he says, I'll tell you what, Bobby, go get a toy, bring it out here, 
play on the ground with me for about half an hour, and then we'll play a game together. So the boy goes, gets his toys, he brings it out, and he starts playing in the living room next to his father. And his father wants half an hour, and I don't know, three minutes goes by, and as five-year-olds can't tell time, the little boy says, has it been half an hour? Is it time? Can we play? Can we, can we do that game now? Well, the father knows he's not going to get anywhere with this. So we noticed that in the Sunday paper, they had inserted a map of the world. So he takes the map, and he takes a pair of scissors, and he cuts it into all these jigsaw pieces, and he takes the boy and takes him to the dining room table, and he says, this is the first of our games for this afternoon. You put this map of the world back together, come and tell me when you're done, and we'll do another game. So the boy is five, so the father figures he's got about half an hour, 40 minutes, and so he goes back to read his paper. Five, six, seven minutes go by, and here comes Bobby, and he runs up and says, okay, I'm finished, what's the next game? So the dad says, well, you're not finished. I mean, I, I wouldn't be finished. So he goes to the dining room, he looks, and there's the piece of paper with the map of the world all put together, everything in the right place, everything just as it was, he had completed the puzzle, and he had completed it perfectly. And so the father says to the boy, how did you do this so quickly? And the little boy says, well, it was really easy. On the back of the map of the world was the picture of a person's face. And I just focused on the person, and when I focused on the person, the world seemed to fall into place. And that, of course, is discipleship. That is our need, that is our gratitude, that is our loyalty. If we focus on the person, focus on the faith of Christ, and live our lives by focusing, making that focus paramount and making that focus first, then the world will simply fall into place. Let us pray. Gracious God, Help our focus to be on you. Help our needs and the world's need to be secondary to all that you give to us, now and always. Amen.